guys, and welcome back to another Lost Bits video right here on Tetra Bay Gaming, the series where we take a look at the unused, scrapped, and unseen content in gaming. As some of you may know, I mostly cover Nintendo content, but this week I'm feeling pretty adventurous, so in this video I'll be diving into my first PlayStation game here on Lost Bits. And what more iconic game is there to start with than the first Crash Bandicoot for the PS1? Hopefully you guys enjoy, as I'd love to cover more games like this in the future. Anyways, go grab some Wampa Fruits and outdated memes, it's time to yeah! into some Lost Bits. Now before we move on to the final game, let's rewind to before the game's release in September 1996. Before Crash was, well, a bandicoot, as early as 1994, he was planned to be a wombat by the name of Willy. Willy the Wombat. And here we can see his early concept art. Even Butch Hartman, the artist behind cartoons like Fairy Odd Parents and Danny Phantom, was commissioned to make some concept sketches. Since I guess the name Willy was deemed too suggestive, Universal Studios Interactive, the game's publisher, was pushing for the name to be changed to something more family-friendly, like Wuzzles, Wes, and uh, Wizzy the Wombat. Yeah, I'm sure the name Wizzy totally wouldn't be joked about either. In any case, due to a copyright dispute with the upcoming Japan-only Willy Wombat game, what, you don't remember Willy Wombat for the Sega Saturn? The character's animal and name were eventually changed to Crash Bandicoot, after his tendency to break stuff. I think it's really cool to see just how much the character's design, let alone name, had changed. Also fun fact, there's a file path in the final release of Crash Bandicoot which still references the name Willy. As I make this video, there are two prototype releases of Crash Bandicoot that have been dumped, both of which have several changes from what was released to the public. There's quite a lot to say about these prototypes, I could probably make a video just about them, but I'll just touch on the parts that I think are the most interesting for this video. The first prototype, with a build date of April 8th, 1996, is currently the earliest known build of the game. Right away, many visual differences are apparent, like the title screen, which looks nothing like what was seen in the final release. Other major visual changes include a different heads-up display font, the word continue used to emerge from the checkpoint boxes, boss health was measured using dots instead of a meter, the end warp pad had a different effect, and the stage map was originally 2D instead of a 3D model. Honestly, I think the 2D version would have aged much better. Then, on top of just general differences in levels like differently placed crates, here the password system also used character icons instead of button inputs, there's basically no music playback, there aren't any gems to obtain, and the Aku Aku masks never turn gold, among several other smaller differences. Oh yeah, and there's also this super basic looking game over screen with Dr. Neocortex chasing Crash. Epic font, bro. This version also has a few not-so-secret debugging features, like being able to unlock all the levels by pressing R1 and L1 on the title screen, as well as invincibility by doing the same in a level. Like I said earlier, there's no music playback code in this build, but there are a few audio files in here that, as such, go unused. The only one that isn't heard in the final release is a track that is meant for a test room, which we'll come back to later. Well, actually, it's two tracks that were supposed to be played simultaneously. Here, let's have a listen. Sound familiar? Well, it should, because it's an arrangement of Dance of the Sugar Plum Fairy from the Nutcracker Suite. I assume this must have either been just a stock asset for the development engine they were using, or they just loaded in the MIDI file for it or something. Next are some graphics and models that go unused in this build. Some textures from an also unused lava cave level, this very basic looking snack, a lava cave plant, a hyena enemy, some unused obstacles for the boulder escaping stages, a rock, a roadblock thing, and an unused animation of Crash spinning like a clock. Looks to be some sort of celebratory animation. 
There are also unused graphics and coating for various fruits that was replaced by the wampa fruits. A coconut, lime, lemon, strawberry, mango, pineapple, grapes, and there's also this bloody yin yang item known as the yin yang yuck. According to this early design document, among the other level design ideas, it looks like the fruit all offered a different number of fruits to the overall count, ranging from 1 to 5. And the yin yang yuck item was supposed to be some sort of secret game pickup, but not much else is known about its full intention. The leftover code for it just counts it as one fruit pickup. Thankfully, just like we saw with Banjo-Kazooie, all the different fruits were just replaced by one other collectible, in this case, the Wampa Fruit. There are quite a few unused levels in this build, but I'm just gonna lump all the unused levels together later, so with that, let's move on to the next prototype. This one has a build date of May 11th, 1996, and was the demo available for E3 of that year. Even though it's only about a month further than the previous prototype, as you can see already with the title screen, some parts are much closer to what was seen in the final release. That said, however, many of the scrapped aspects, like the boss health dots, are still present. Unfortunately, there's not as much interesting stuff left unused in this version, and many of the differences are the same as in the previous build. The only really notable unused things in this build are an unused intro part to the End Sanity Beach tune, as well as a weird glitch that would cause the Bandicoot subtext on the title screen to appear flipped for some reason. Yeah, it's pretty strange. Now with those prototype builds out of the way, it's now time to move on to the final retail release of Crash Bandicoot. Let's again start off with some unused sounds. There's a full version of the door opening sound that normally has the last two seconds cut off. A boomerang sound that's a leftover from a boomerang hazard from the E3 build, which was scrapped. And finally, a warp sound effect that goes unused here, but was originally heard as the checkpoint sound in the April prototype. Furthermore, there are several Japanese exclusive tracks. I guess these aren't completely unused, but we're focusing on the North American version here, so yeah. These alternate tracks are all themes for Dr. Neo Cortex, Dr. Nitrous Brio, Pinstripe Potteroo, Koala Kong, as well as the Tana bonus round. Apparently, these were all changed for the Japanese version of the game last minute since the Japanese division of Sony felt that the boss music needed to sound more video game-like. Whatever that means. And apparently the Tana bonus round music was too nostalgic sounding? What? I'll just play you a quick sample of each song to show all you non-Japanese gamers what you've been missing. Now onto some more unused graphics and objects, first are the unused obstacles meant for the boulder stages I mentioned earlier, only here we can see them properly textured. Then there's also this unused guard dog enemy that was meant to be seen in the heavy machinery and castle machinery levels, and also a graphic saying loading, press start, just in the wrong order. It was again used in the E3 build, but is seen nowhere in the final release. Next up, once thought to have been meant for a Crash Bandicoot cartoon spin-off, is actually a completely scrapped intro and ending that was meant to be used in the game. Crash. 
Crash Bandicoot should have been a genius, but he doesn't quite compute. The game's designer and producer, David Siller, mentions that after Universal licensed the game to Sony, this cartoon look was cut since they were really pushing the 3D looks of the PlayStation 1. This is probably the same reasoning the level select map was changed too. It's too bad, because I really like the style of this cartoon. It reminds me of other awesome 90s cartoons like Animaniacs or Dexter's Lab. And who knows, in some alternate timeline where they kept this cartoon intro, there may have been a very successful cartoon that came out of it. Crash Bandicoot also has a hidden test save system that can be added to the title screen by using the following GameShark code in the North American version. This is about as close as it currently gets to a debug mode for this game. The main purpose of this extra mode is to test the game saving system. It offers a save file with a game 63% complete which can either be saved right to a save slot or reached by using a cheat code which this mode also provides. That's cool and all on its own cause it can unlock most of the game for you if you're lazy like I am, but there are also a few more debug features on top of this. During a level, several button combinations unlock a slew of different effects. Pressing L1 and R1 down will grant the player invincibility, L1 and R2 grants the player an Aku Aku power up, L1, R2 three times followed by L1, R1 and R2 grants a permanent Aku Aku, Pressing L1, L2, and also clearing a level with all the crates broken instantly collects all the gems and keys in the entire game. And lastly, pressing L1 and L2 and clearing a bonus round will similarly unlock all the playable levels in the entire game, in addition to getting the game 100% complete with all the gems and keys obtained. Unfortunately, I'm pretty sure this is prohibited in speedrunning this game. Just, uh, nobody tell Billy Mitchell about this, okay? So the very talented Neko Run or Deep Game Research made it possible to move the camera around in this game, but unfortunately due to the way the game handles how graphics are loaded, as you can see there's really not much to see outside of what's normally visible. So with that, finally my favorite part, time to check out some of Crash Bandicoot's unused levels. First are a few that never made it into any known playable version of the original game. Starting things off is a cut lava cave level that I briefly touched on earlier in this video. According to programmer and co-creator Andy Gavin, this was one of the first stages to have been developed for the game. It was apparently cut for several reasons, namely its memory usage from the large amount of polygons that were used, and that the orange color of the lava was deemed too distracting from Crash's color, hence why there aren't any lava levels, period. Although the stage isn't currently playable, some fans were able to view parts of the level with a customized tool and see what it was supposed to look like. It was noted that the stage is fully textured, though vertex shading and many polygons are missing. Still cool that we get a glimpse into what could have been a pretty interesting looking stage. Next is a jungle level, and as you can see, it's left pretty unfinished with only a few textures. Interestingly, some fans have also noted that the camera path for the stage bears a strange resemblance to the first stage in Donkey Kong. But yeah, not too much else to say about this. Moving along, now are some unused levels that can be accessed by tweaking the code in the April prototype of the game. First is the smallest unused level, simply just known as the test level. It's a very basic and small area that was used to test various things like level geometry, items, lighting, the spider and lab assistant enemies, and crash turning green. And as you can see on the bottom, there's this weird texture of Crash's face tiled. According to Andy Gavin, this level was mostly used for testing since due to its size, it was able to be processed much faster than any of the other levels. Apparently as fast as 3 minutes compared to as much as 6 hours for some other levels. It's not the biggest test room, but I always love these tiny ones with lots in them. And as a bonus, collecting all 3 Tana tokens found in the crates will automatically cause the player to load into a Tana bonus round. That looks like it was an early version of the Brio bonus areas from the final game. This one's normally not clearable since Crash can't jump this large gap, but with invincibility or moon jump enabled, we can get across to see Tana waiting for us on the other side. Hey. 
She will then give you a very subpar looking cheat code to use with the main menu. Unfortunately, it doesn't seem to do anything. Next up is a cliffside level which has the player traversing down the cliff. This level is also very incomplete as throughout it are various untextured objects and broken collision detection, which results in crash, walking under the stage, or just on nothing. The life and wampa fruit counter is completely broken, and the texture on Crash's back is also incorrect. Looks like he's growing some grass on his back or something. Here we can also see many of the objects that go unused in the game otherwise that I mentioned earlier like the rocks, the roadblocks, and the hyena enemies which just stand there, menacingly. Overall, a pretty basic platforming stage. Next up is a waterfall themed level, and I honestly think this one looks really cool. There are various platforms, more of the scrapped hyena enemies, a cool log catapult thing, and more. Unfortunately, many parts of the stage are still unfinished or untextured, so it's kind of an eyesore. There's also no way to complete the stage, as eventually you'll just get to a dead end. Since the end of the level is similar to Ripper Roo's boss level, it is believed that this stage may have once been planned to appear before the boss fight instead. An unused cavern level is up next, and this one is certainly one of the more polished scrapped levels, at least visually. This cavern has an awesome glowing green and purple color palette that looks so cool. Now even though there aren't any enemies here, pretty much everything can kill you. Move too far to the left, dead. Touch a wall, dead too. Oddly enough though, the acid here doesn't kill you. No, that makes total sense. Again, this level ends abruptly with another dead end. What's even more interesting is that the code for this level still exists in the final retail version of the game. Although since the rest of the levels use a different coding format, this level just crashes the game if you try to load it in. And speaking of the final release of Crash Bandicoot, there are also two more unused stages left over that are still accessible with the use of a GameShark code. The first of these is what appears to be a slightly updated version of the early Tana bonus room from the prototype, only this one doesn't have Tana or any character present at the end. It's again normally unclearable without invincibility or moon jump, but even with those, you're not missing much, and at best you'll just get the game crash on you. And last up is an unused level that's quite famous amongst Crash fans, Stormy Ascent. If you've played the new Insane Trilogy remake of the game, you may also recognize this stage as it was recreated and brought back into the game as one of the bonus DLC stages. Anyways, this scrapped level is the most complete. There aren't any missing textures, the collision detection is all there, the enemies are functional. Yeah, this level was basically ready for release. Why was it cut then, you might be asking? Well, again, according to Andy Gavin, the stage was simply just deemed too difficult, and the dev team didn't have time to make it any easier, despite it being one of his favorite courses to have been made for the game. Thankfully though, like I said, the stage was eventually remade and made available to the masses, even if it did start with a $3 price tag. The level itself is pretty good, and I love the setting. But I have to agree, it's quite the difficult level. I guess it's time to get good. But with that concludes this Lost Bits video on Crash Bandicoot and I hope you guys enjoyed. As always, if you did and want to see me cover more Crash and other Sony games in the future, be sure to slap a like down below, it really helps me out a lot and lets me know you're interested. Also, if you enjoyed this video and want to see more Lost Bits like it, you can do so by clicking on the card right here. If you want to stay even more up to date, be sure to subscribe here and swing by my Twitter and other social media things, all of which will be linked in the description below. And if you would like to support the channel, check out my merch at tetrabitgaming.com or consider becoming the latest Tetrabit channel member by clicking the join button below the video. But as always guys, thank you all so much for tuning in, and I will see you in a bit.